The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, my name is Mike Willett at the Intertribal Council of Michigan's National Native Network. Welcome to the NNN webinar series on cancer risk reduction in Indian Country. This webinar is titled Obesity Prevention Using Multiple Approaches to Support Wellness. This technical assistance webinar is being hosted by the National Native Network with Indian Health Service, Health Disease, Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, excuse me, which offers technical assistance and resources for commercial tobacco prevention and control through Indian Country and the Indian Health Service Clinical Support Center. Your presenter today is Captain Heidi Blank, PhD, Chief Obesity Prevention and Control Branch from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We're pleased to offer continuing education credits for participants in this webinar. Faculty, um, no commercial interest support was used to fund this activity. This activity is designated one contact hour for nurses. And to obtain a certificate for continuing education, you must be registered for the course, participate in the webinar in its entirety, and support a completed post-webinar survey. The, post, the link for the post-webinar survey will be coming out of GoToWebinar. There will be a link uh, sent to everybody's email address uh, tomorrow and it will um, click to a SurveyMonkey link. And if you just complete that and fill out your contact information, we will go ahead and send out a continuing education certificate. By the end of this webinar, participants will be able to examine the prevalence of obesity and overweight and how it contributes to the high rates of chronic conditions and diseases among American Indians and Alaska Natives. Identify risk factors that contribute to overweight and obesity, and collaborate through multiple sectors to implement effective strategies to address overweight and obesity. And now at this time, I will throw it over to Captain Heidi Blank. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mike, and thanks for the organizers for hosting me today. I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about um, where I sit at the CDC. So I'm at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as Mike mentioned, and we are a sister uh, agency to a number of initiatives that happen in, in other groups related to childhood obesity, but I'm going to talk today a little bit about the role that, that we serve. Within the Chronic Center at the CDC, my division is Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity, uh, but I'm also going to talk about some of the school health initiatives that are out of our Division of Population Health. So in our division, we're a team of about 125 scientists, physicians, and prevention experts, really trying to lead the nation's fight against the health and economic burden of chronic disease. We work on promoting good behaviors such as nutrition, regular physical activity, uh, stress management, more sleep. And we do this through trying to reach larger systems, so policy systems and environmental supports, so that people across the lifespan can improve, uh, improve their daily habits. And we do this through science to practice. This comes in the form of things like funding and resources, tool development, technical assistance, evaluation, and monitoring, but we can't do it alone. But what keeps us uh, energized and excited about the work we're doing is that seven of the top 10 leading causes of death in the US are from chronic diseases, uh, unhealthy diets and a lack of physical activity, as well as areas such as poor sleep and poor stress management, do add to the illness, suffering, and early death linked to chronic disease. And as a nation, treating people with chronic diseases accounts for about 86% of our nation's healthcare costs. But in addition to health, we know that benefits to improving community opportunities and individual wellness includes many other non-health related areas, such as better school attendance, worker productivity, as well as the ability to serve our nation. I've included a link here at the bottom to um, an infographic that we were able to co-release related to um, uh, unfit to serve, which shows that obesity and a lack of fitness are actually decreasing the ability for young Americans to actually take part in careers of their choice, 
This could be such as serving in the military, becoming a firefighter, or a police officer. So again, we really want to ensure that every child is growing up to their potential. So as we think about that, we start off by thinking about getting a healthy start. So I'm going to talk a little bit about early nutrition, such as breastfeeding and the zero to two age. I'm going to talk about how to maintain that through the toddler and school aged years. Also going to talk about community and organizations where all families and adults spend their time, as well as ways to stay active and to learn about appropriate physical activity. As a big part of the learning objective today, I wanted to step back and talk a little bit about how public health defines obesity. So in our reports and in the materials that we publish, we talk about obesity using body mass index or BMI. And this is a relatively simple measure of weight divided by height squared. It's inexpensive, but it is a screening measure and not made to be a diagnostic measure. In adults, having a BMI at or equal to 30 represents having obesity. But in children, we actually plot their BMI against a sex-specific reference standard that was created decades ago of children of the same age. Uh, I'm going to show an example of this using uh, the graph on the right that is a representation of one of the CDC's growth charts that are often used in, in clinics and other healthcare settings. So in children two and older, uh, we would take their height and weight and we would actually do this plotting on a CDC growth chart. The example I have in the middle here shows that a 10 year old girl who is four feet five inches and weighs about 120 pounds would have a BMI of 25.1. When we plot that against this growth chart again with age on the bottom here and that BMI, we can see that that girl actually falls in having um, a percentile here that we would call having obesity. So um, it's important to utilize these age and sex specific standards when we're thinking about childhood obesity. And as you can see here, being above the, uh, at or above the 95th percentile represents having obesity. This is just an overall slide to show as a nation where we are at. Um, so this is data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, our large national survey, uh, where we are able to get measured heights and weights. And you can see here that unfortunately, all levels of children, two to five, six to 11, and 12 to 19, um, are suffering from higher rates of obesity uh, than we would like to see. Um, we've kind of stabilized in the two to five-year-old, uh, looking at modeling related to that. But unfortunately, we're, we're, we're still seeing these very high rates in our adolescent and high school group of 20.6%. When we look at data that's specific to American Indian or Alaska Native data, um, one of our data sources is the WIC-PC. This is data that we partner with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and this is from um, the Women and Infants Children's Program based on data that they collect every two, to year, two, two years. This data shows here among children uh, in, those, in those agencies that the prevalence of overweight and obesity among children two to four years of age is about 37.5%. And as you can see from this bar chart of by race ethnicity, um, unfortunately, American Indian Alaska Native children have very high rates, 37.5%. When we look at other data that we have um, on the same WIC, WIC participants, this is data that goes till 2014. I'll direct your attention to an area where I've circled. Um, this is actually um, Native American children who are not part of the tribal WIC data but actually living in, in other um, communities and being seen in, in uh, community WIC clinics. You can see here um, that although they do have a high magnitude of obesity, the good news is that there's actually, um, we're starting to see a decline since 2010 uh, in this population of having obesity. And then this is very specific data um, that USDA was able to share from the tribal WIC agency data, again, for those two to four year olds. So what we saw um, in the earlier part of the 2000s from 2004 to 2010 was that eight out of 28 tribes did have a statistically significant increase in obesity prevalence among the toddlers with only two tribes going down. But again, the good news is from 2010 to 2014, only two of the 20 to 29 tribes had this increase and six tribes now had a significant decrease. So we think things are starting to go in the right direction, um, and we can talk a little bit about the solutions that are occurring in our communities um, that might be aiding that. And then in general, I wanted to share that from about 37 tribes that take part in the WIC-PC data, um, the obesity prevalence does have a, a, a high range from about 8.2% 
uh, in the Oklahoma data to about 38.2% uh, in the Ute Mountain. Um, before I go a lot farther in talking about obesity, I did want to step back a little bit and talk about pathophysiology. So when I was in grad school and in my early uh, career in this area, um, when we thought about obesity, we thought um, that it was a little bit more of a cosmetic issue, um, that this storage tissue, um, we didn't really know that much about it. Over time, what we've realized is that adipose cells are very metabolically active and that their amount, their distribution, and their secretory function really determines their impact on, on body function. So we know now that excess adiposity causes inflammation in the body uh, and that accumulation of fat within muscles and organs um, actually leads to a, um, dysregulation. So for example, fat in the muscle leads to release of a thing called myokines, and this actually can change then that muscle or organ's ability um, to have normal function. So insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance um, is an example of how obesity can lead to type 2 diabetes. Uh, and now we also are, are going to chat a little bit about uh, what we know about obesity and cancer. Um, in addition to these system changes, uh, we also know that excess weight impacts the body structurally. So if we think about mechanical issues related to obesity, we think about joint and bone problems as well as sleep apnea. So uh, in general, we know there are a lot of health risks. In this slide, I just want to point out that having obesity during childhood increases both immediate and the future health risks. So from data and citations that we're able to bring together, we show that children who have obesity have lower self-esteem, higher anxiety and depression, breathing problems such as asthma or, or sleep apnea. Uh, it puts them on the path toward cardiovascular disease, such as having higher blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, toward the path to type 2 diabetes with impaired glucose tolerance and insulin resistance. As I mentioned, structurally can lead to some joint problems and also um, some changes in growth plates and growth. Um, we're going to talk more about this, but as a child goes on, because um, we have data to show that most children don't grow out of this, we know that there are actually now 13 types of cancer that are related to, to obesity. Um, and in general, we want our children to be happy. Uh, I'm a mom of two, 14 and 17, uh, and so uh, as I think about my children, I think about their health, but I really also am concerned about you know, their social, their emotional lives. So really, um, unfortunately, a lot of children with obesity do face bullying and stigma, um, and also report in studies lower self-reported quality of life. So as I mentioned, uh, last year, our division and the Division of Cancer um, here at the CDC published for the first time a vital signs related to obesity and cancer. Um, and this is on the heels of a uh, large data review showing that we now have 13 cancers that are associated with overweight and obesity. Um, you can see from the picture here um, that there's a lot of new information that we're learning about mechanisms uh, and the types of cancers that are affected by adiposity. This is important because I think overall, the news has been that we've seen some reductions in cancers, um, such as lung cancer, um, that are not associated with overweight and obesity. So those that are related to more of tobacco products. Unfortunately, as you can see here in the middle graph, uh, we have an increase of 7% in cancers associated with overweight and obesity. Um, so a lot more to do to ensure that the public is knowledgeable about this. We also have data to show only one in three uh, American adults has uh, knowledge uh, that there's some relationship between obesity and cancer. So in addition to the health benefits, we know that um, having our children be healthier, whether through nutrition, physical activity, and, and, and adiposity, um, we can improve school readiness. They have higher academic achievement as adults have less absenteeism and greater worker productivity. And then as, as we've talked about here, reduction of chronic disease and really ensuring um, you know, emotional and mental health benefits. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the risk factors and we're gonna talk about them at multiple levels. One is really at that individual, family, social and peer area, uh, what I'm calling individual factors. So we'll talk a little bit about breastfeeding and parenting practices, diet, physical activity, sedentary time, uh, sleep, and stress management. And then we'll talk a little bit um, more about the solutions um, because of the risk factors we all are being exposed to in our communities. Uh, and this is really where we think about policy system and environment approaches 
of how we can have safe places for physical activity, more convenient access to healthier foods and beverages and those that are affordable, um, how we can still do a good job of ensuring people have the right skills and in nutrition and health literacy. And then again, um, quality health care. So if we're screening uh, for childhood obesity, are we ensuring that we're then um, providing counseling and options to be referred to lifestyle programs that can help uh, individual children, adults, and families? So the next data slide that I'm going to show starts to look at some of the risk factor data. So this is an example that we have from CDC's National Immunization Survey. And in this slide, we're looking at trends over time in breastfeeding. And so this is really initiation, so children who were ever breastfed. Um, you can see in this data um, that the subgroup with the lowest uh, pre prevalence of being ever breastfed um, are non-Hispanic Blacks. Uh, and then we have a little bit better data related to um, non-Hispanic Whites and Hispanic. Um, so with Native American populations here um, falling a little bit in between. Um, similarly, looking at children who are breastfed at six months, um, again, um, the data we have from uh, Alaska Native American Indian population shows, again, um, a little little close here to, to a little above 50%. Um, so still, um, that's good news, but still more progress in ensuring that moms who have an intention to breastfeed um, are really able to meet, meet that desire. We know generally that unfortunately fewer than one in 10 children eat the recommended daily amounts of vegetables in our country, um, and that we also have a ways to go in ensuring our high school students are physically active. So in looking at some of the specific data we have, um, so for example, here using the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey from 2013, um, we're able to look at data here by sex, age, and as well as race, ethnicity. Um, this is a, a good news um, in the sense that here we're seeing that Alaska Native and American Indian children um, are um, doing a little better than, than some of the other groups. But again, um, that's only one in three that are really meeting their aerobic physical activity. Um, this is a pretty busy slide, but um, what we've done is gone ahead and in the data for American Indian Alaska Native, gone ahead and put the prevalence here. So this is data that we use nationally to look at our Healthy People 2020 measures. So this again is adults engaging in no leisure time physical activity. Um, and then this looks at across the years 2008 to 2016. Uh, you can see here again, um, we had a high back in 2008 of um, almost one in two um, getting um, no leisure time physical activity. And that's now gone down over time to 34.3% or one in three. So we're actually seeing some positive news there um, that, that, uh, is, is that having no leisure time physical activity is improving. Um, so we look at the data for those that are meeting recommendations, which again is, is trying to get about a moderate or vigorous uh, data for 150 minutes. Um, so again, this is one of the healthy people measures. And so looking at the data from the National Health Interview Survey over time, if you look at the far uh, right side here, we can see uh, the data from American Indian Alaska Native is about 43.2%. Um, so Again, um, more room, uh, still needing about 57% of, of adults to continue to strive to that 150 minutes a week. Um, nutrition information is sometimes a little more difficult to find. Um, this is a study, though, that was published um, this year and looking at um, daily sugar sweetened beverage consumption. Um, so we know that sugar sweetened beverages um, are low in nutrients um, and high in calories. Uh, and there's data to support that they're related to obesity, diabetes, and other chronic diseases. So if we look at the far right slide here, we can see uh, overall that about one in three adults uh, who are American Indian Alaska Native reported drinking sugary drinks every day. Um, so this is more than one. And then surprisingly, if we look at the data among those who report having prediabetes or no diabetes, you can see still one in four people with diabetes reported having this behavior, um, and almost half reported this uh, who didn't have diabetes. So again, um, somewhat striking data to show a behavior um, uh, that, that definitely uh, nutrition professionals and other um, can, can bring about some awareness of, of the relationship of these uh, behaviors to chronic disease. So we've covered kind of some prevalence of overweight and obesity. Uh, we've covered a number of the risk factors um, but I also want to talk about risk factors farther, 
farther out from the individual. And that's really to think about community-wide prevention as well as clinical interventions. This is a slide um, that uh, we've adapted from uh, John Auerbach, who at the time was um, a policy lead at CDC. And he kind of bucketed obesity prevention and management into three areas. So on the far left in number one, we have what we call traditional clinical interventions. So this could be screening for things like BMI, physical activity or food insecurity. Um, uh, optimized care would include counseling. It could include um, being referred to something like a healthy weight clinic within, within the health system. Um, more of what was termed innovative clinical prevention are more of what we think about when we think about the diabetes prevention program or the DPP, or similar to that, we have DPP for kids, um, uh, programs like MEND, Mind, Exercise, Nutrition, Do It, as well as ensuring that uh, if screening happens for food security, that we're linking individuals to community assets for food security. And then that third bucket or number three is what a lot of us at CDC um, do with the, with the resources and public health grant programs here, which is community-wide prevention. So this might be in child care or what we call the early care and education space, schools, communities, work sites, retail, faith-based venues. Um, and so again, um, we'll talk a little bit about how that fits into a lot of the prevention initiatives. And then also, I think, um, you know, as public health has evolved in the last decade, um, we're trying to understand more how community coalitions, community partners are also considering the social determinants of health. And so aspects related to poverty, housing, education, um, areas that we didn't talk about, such as, um, you know, uh, substance abuse and other ways. So how do we think about the larger context of the community as we try to drop in some of these buckets? So often uh, in obesity prevention, we do think about these multiple levels, multiple sectors and settings where there are modifiable um, risk factors or obesity related factors. So uh, in some of the education and in counseling initiatives, we could be thinking about the individual, this inner circle, but really um, people are connected um, through their families, through their clans, through their community. And so again, thinking about um, social networks, parenting practices, um, cultural gatherings and places where we're really coming together um, as, uh, as families and friends. Um, we think about the places where uh, folks are often spending their days, whether that's childcare, schools, work sites, um, or um, here and there in the healthcare setting. Uh, we think about community, so whether we have sidewalks that are uh, leading us to, to destinations, uh, whether we are able to have healthy food retail opportunities, or are we living in a place with food swamps? Um, and then we think about these larger policies, programs, incentives that may come out of um, the government level. And so again, do we have appropriate transportation to healthy food stores? Uh, are we having agricultural supports that ensure healthier foods are being grown and transported? Um, how are we ensuring that folks um, are able to be on food assistance programs? So as you can see here, uh, when we say we, we can't do it alone, um, it's because many of the behaviors that we're trying to support um, are based on the context um, of, of where a person is, is walking through their day and, and how they're um, interacting with their environment. So for children, uh, we often think about ways to support um, moms and families during pregnancy. Again, through uh, optimizing uh, both the engagement they may have um, with physicians, um, with community health workers, uh, with, with folks who are able to uh, ensure that a healthy pregnancy then leads to healthy infants. We again think about the family and parental habits and ways we can support that. And then again, institutions. So once our children um, are off going to childcare in schools or their healthcare interactions, how can we make that the best? And then that broader community environment. So I want to start first here in thinking about getting a healthy start. So in the breastfeeding area, we do have a set of evidence-based practices that are supported in the hospital, really in those first few hours and days after birth um, to really support moms who have an intent to nurse. Um, one of the ways we do that is through uh, the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative, and part of that is also monitored um, by a national survey called the Maternity Practices in Infant Nutrition and Care, or MPINC survey. This really assesses the maternity care practices to support early initiation and breastfeeding. The nice thing about this survey is that it is a census, 
and therefore each facility that fills out the MPANC survey is sent back their report. They're able to see how they're doing. They're able to see how their state uh, or other uh, um, jurisdictions are doing. So on the right-hand slide here, I'm providing data um, related to the NPINC scores. This is from the years 2009 through 2015. So the survey happens every two years. Um, and in the good news, you can see here um, from the Indian Health Service, from the um, hospitals that are serving moms there, you can see this uh, tremendous increase from a score of 54 in 2009 up to now a 91 in 2015 really showing that those supports have happened in the last six years. Um, the tribal average here um, outside of just IHS shows about going from a 65 to an 84. Um, and then overall here for both the tribe, tribal uh, areas of the catchment and the Indian Health Service facilities, just this great improvement from a 57 to an 89. Um, so that just shows the tremendous, tremendous work that Indian Health Service, um, CDC and others uh, have been doing to really help ensure um, that our partners um, in these clinical venues are really supporting moms. In addition to those first couple of days, we really also need to ensure their social support and community resources for moms once they leave the hospital um, and also supportive workplaces. So we know that there are laws in place for large workplaces to have breastfeeding accommodations, those with over 50 uh, employees. Um, but we need to continue to work on both smaller venues um, and ways to have more breaks uh, and safe uh, places for moms to continue to nurse. Um, in addition to breastfeeding, early child nutrition, uh, when we say that, we really mean the zero to two years of age. This is the time um, where a lot of parents struggle uh, with, with early uh, feeding practices. So we know that um, babies have a great system of hunger cues and satiety cues. Um, and so we often um, need to really let them uh, lead us in, in uh, use, it, use of bottles or breastfeeding. Um, so we, we need, we know from data not to top off or to try to um, have children eat more uh, than, than they um, are interested in. Um, it also comes down to also ensuring that other caregivers, aunts, uncles, grandparents um, who are involved understand um, kind of the healthy behaviors and eating patterns. So we've developed a website here on infant and toddler nutrition um, that kind of walks through a number of areas. Um, it's helpful for what people would call picky eaters as well. Uh, we know from data that babies and toddlers need to have a um, high amount of exposure to, to new foods um, and so give some helpful tips um, for people not to give up uh, when they're first introducing those first foods. Um, the ECE or child care area, early care and education, um, has really um, come forward in the last um, eight to ten years as a really important area to uh, consider for childhood obesity. We know that nationally over 60% of three to five year olds are in childcare weekly and over 11 million spend at least 30 hours a week there. So although parents and caregivers um, can really do their best, uh, if our children are going to facilities like Early Head Start, Head Start or child care centers, um, we've got a lot to do as a country to ensure um, that those places are as healthy as they can be. So as part of this, um, CDC and other partners have created um, what we call the spectrum uh, to really think about what are the systems level improvements that can ensure obesity practices. So as a nation, we have a national uh, uh, guidelines that we work with for EC centers, but we know that a lot of these things happen through regulations, quality rating systems, licensing, um, TA networks, and so we have a lot of opportunities, both voluntarily um, and through policy and through other approaches where we can be um, ensuring that health and safety um, really broadens out to include things like nutrition, physical activity, and screen time. And I've included a website here. We also know that um, often children uh, who are already struggling with obesity uh, may not have uh, as many opportunities to um, take part in programs that are structured for them. So at the CDC, we've been working as part of our CORD project or the Childhood Obesity Research Demonstration um, to really be able to package and have more of these pediatric programs for kids. Examples um, that are starting to appear in more places in our country include MEND, which is Mind, Exercise, Nutrition, Do It, as well as within the YMCA, the Healthy Weight in Your Child. So I've included a link here um, that'll show a little bit more about how to optimize childhood obesity management. 
Similarly, for that school-aged youth, the CDC uh, School Health Branch does quite a bit of work with USDA and Department of Education um, as a, as a three-legged stool here to ensure that nutrition, physical activity, obesity are really thought about um, to really ensure that our children are as healthy as they can be. Um, and again, a student really sits embedded within her home and families, the school and the community. So again, we've got multiple layers um, for us to think about how to approach obesity prevention. Um, and as a, as a group, we've really moved to what's now called the WISC model. So the whole school, whole community, whole child framework. Again, really not separating um, the child from these other environments. And so we know that healthy students learn better and that health behaviors link with lower risk of obesity. So I've included a number of resources here um, to ensure that folks are aware that we have cer certain uh, areas where we really each um, can wear the hat of either as a parent, as a PTA member, as a wellness member, as a, a board of health, um, or a school council member. So we can think about things like the wellness policies. Uh, we can do self-assessments on how well we're doing, such as the school health index. Uh, we can use the health curriculum tool or the HECAT to look at the types of nutrition, physical activity, education that are being supported in the schools. Um, and then there's evidence-based interventions for schools. I've listed two sites here um, that often are looked at. One is the UNC Center for Training and Research Translation, uh, where you can find a number of initiatives uh, related to schools, as well as the SNAP-Ed Toolkit, which again uh, shows evidence-based interventions and has materials that show how to implement these. Um, another initiative that is still active is the Salad Bars to School Initiative. So during the last administration, we were able to work with the First Lady on a partnership uh, related to salad bars to schools. Um, there are over 5,300 uh, salad bars at this point uh, that have been placed in schools um, with over 274 schools still waiting. Um, but this is still an active campaign. So if you have schools that are interested in taking part, you can check out this website uh, and see about the application process for that. So in addition to that childcare and school environment, we also think about our communities quite a bit. Um, and so as CDC, we work on what we call healthy food environments. And again, um, this is again thinking about our partners and the places where people spend their time, like work sites, hospitals, food banks. Um, and then I'll spend a little bit of time here getting into to more of that and the physical activity environment. So a few years ago, we did publish a, a guide to strategies to increase the consumption of fruits and vegetables. Um, this source is still available um, and really goes into a number of opportunities um, that we'll talk about, such as nutrition standards for the areas I've talked about, uh, farm to institution, uh, institutional food service, food retail, the assistance programs, food policy councils, and farmers markets. So just another nice resource to show that these multiple organizations have the ability uh, to change the healthy defaults and especially uh, more fruits and vegetables. A big initiative we've taken at CDC is to think about um, how to uh, learn from uh, what we're doing here at a federal level. So we've published in 2017 the Federal Food Service Guidance for uh, Foods, Food Service Guidance for Federal Facilities. Our first um, phase of this was in 2011, where we worked with the General Services Administration to put out the first version of these. These are a, a translation from the dietary guidelines into foods that should be offered in concessions, snack shops, vending. Um, this was a collaborative process with over 60 representatives from nine federal groups. Um, and the guidelines go through food and nutrition standards, uh, facility efficiency, environmental support, and community development. This is where the farm to area sits. Food safety, and then behavioral design, which includes things like product placement, pricing, and promotion. So again, it's a voluntary set, um, and um, just a few months ago, our own CDC had our first policy here around healthy food. So it's often, um, I consider it a stealth health approach about how to really ensure that when we're purchasing uh, foods for, for these large menu, venues, that we're including healthy options. Um, in addition to fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and some of the other food areas, I did also want to talk about food insecurity. Um, this, we have a number of data set, sets, including USDA, that, that shows um, household food insecurity. Um, this is just a map that comes out of one of the largest um, groups in America, Feeding America, that's called Map the Meal Gap. 
because I don't want to lose sight um, that as we think about social determinants of health and community health, we need to think about food security. So uh, this is a model that's adapted from Hilary Seligman and Dean uh, Schillinger. Uh, it was published in the New England Journal, and uh, Feeding America has looked at this as well. As we think about the cycles of food insecurity and chronic disease, um, we think about where are the places, these layering on of approaches that can benefit uh, food security and wellness. So in our outer spheres here, we see things like community interventions, clinic-based interventions, hospitals, and policy. Um, we know that the individual sits within a social environment and policy area here, and that unfortunately, people who are struggling with food security um, are shown to have higher admission rates for emergency rooms, um, have higher um, uh, uh, concerns and issues with medication and being able to be medication ad adherents um, because of, of uh, concerns around food, um, and then just um, problems that, that arise from um, issues related to cost of food, housing, and others. So um, just a diagram that, again, kind of shows that um, people with food insecurity often um, can really have worsened health impacts uh, because of this. So um, as a public health agency, we wanted to understand how clinics and communities were really combining interventions to address food insecurity. And so this last year, we published a paper that's in Preventing Chronic Disease, where we assessed 20 promising um, initiatives. So folks self-nominated to have us do interviews to understand um, how they were going about addressing food insecurity. Um, so again, often this was through a health system who either had, uh, had used screening tools and then either had a platform such as a referral or a list of food resources in the community. Uh, many had a patient navigator or case manager that was able to help individuals um, obtain food assistance uh, applications or charitable or emergency food. Um, and so um, uh, the paper, I think, just points out the number of ways that are, are starting to um, crisscross in the nation here to think about uh, food insecurity as it relates to chronic disease. Uh, and for those who do work in, in the clinical setting, um, uh, unlike the USDA metrics, which are household food insecurity, these two, uh, two questions, which are called the hunger vital sign, um, have actually been used now in a number of electronic health record um, approaches. And this is really, again, um, individualized to um, whether they were worried about food would run out before the, enough money and what they bought didn't last. And so these have been validated um, against the larger screening modules and seem to really work well in the clinic setting. So if you're interested in more and in seeing how um, folks have either used community benefits, have done community health needs assessments, we have two tools available. Um, one's called Tackling Hunter, Community Health Needs Assessment Guidance. And the other here is the food insecurity screening algorithms um, that are for children, adults, and for individuals with diabetes. Uh, next, I wanted to talk a little bit, uh, switch gears to talk about physical activity. Um, so we had the ability to really review the evidence related to physical activity, um, and physical activity really is a wonder drug. Um, there seems to be emerging evidence uh, almost monthly here related to things such as brain health and cognition during aging, um, in addition to all that we knew about you know, healthy growth development and, and early adulthood. So as part of Step It Up, we have five goals as part of the Surgeon General's call to action, including making walking a national priority, really designing communities that make it safe and easy to walk for people of all ages and abilities, um, and that also includes rolling for you know, individuals with wheelchairs, um, promoting programs and policies to support walking, providing information to encourage walking. This could be things like wayfinding or signs, um, and then continuing to really um, monitor and see how we're doing as a nation. So Step It Up came out, and on the heels of that, we did have a community preventive services um, uh, recommendation come out, so what we call the community guide. And this came out and showed that built environment approaches that combine transportation um, with uh, design were really beneficial. And so um, combining the interventions from two major categories came forward to show that it improved physical activity. So again, um, walking infrastructure, biking infrastructure, and public transit. And then um, really thinking more about how planners um, consider land use 
So again, mixed land use, uh, residential density, park and rec facilities. Um, I think all of us uh, who um, uh, have children many times want to take a walk to the library or a walk to the park. Um, and so again, activity friendly destinations um, definitely has the ability to keep folks out of their cars and have them um, more walking to destinations. So again, um, in urban environments, thinking about this, but also in rural environments, really understanding the anchor institutions, our community centers, um, ways that we can facilitate um, in a rural environment, how land use is also a part of this. So again, um, you know, we, public health can't do it alone. We have very little money as public health um, for these initiatives. So we have to think of it as a broader community. So again, transportation, land use and, and design, um, the park and rec area, how they fit in, um, education, such as if schools are anchor institutions, are they able to have shared use agreements in place so that people can use the track, uh, that we can do silver sneakers on the weekend so we can really ensure that it's easy, uh, an easy opportunity to walk Again, chambers of commerce, businesses, and others who can take part in this. Um, we have a lot of nonprofits and others um, who have an interest in, in walking. Uh, Faith-based organizations, again, uh, really involved in supporting families. Our healthcare, we have things like Park Rx and um, uh, physical activity vital signs. So again, ensuring that they're talking to patients about their physical activity, not just for obesity, but for, for mental health, for emotional, for stress management. Um, again, and those of us in public health and then all of our citizens. So again, everyone has a role to play. Um, next, I wanted to talk about some new opportunities um, and so uh, in the last five years, um, our DMPAO group had supported um, our state health agencies through a grant program called 1305. We now have a new one that was just released uh, in the last few days, um, the announcement of the new funded grantees, and that's called SPAN, the State Physical Activity and Nutrition Program. Uh, we're gonna be able to reach 16 state health agencies. Um, some of these do include tribal areas, um, so I've included the website here so you can take a look at that. These includes folks like um, you know, Washington State um, and others who I know have worked with tribal areas. Um, the REACH program, the Racial and Ethnic Approaches to Community Health, which has had a number of tribal communities in the last five years, um, is now going to fund um, 30 communities. Um, we're hopeful that a few of those will be tribal and that will be um, up on our website in the next uh, 10 days. And so now we'll have um, the ability to um, help uh, a few more communities related to this. And this includes tobacco use as well. Um, and then we have another program that we've had for about the past five years called the HOP, or High Obesity Program. Um, the eligibility for this program was based on BRFSS data, where communities were shown to have 40% or more adult obesity. Um, and so I know, for example, um, this was just released in the last week, um, that one of the example um, of those 16, and these are land-grant universities, is that the University of Wisconsin, um, their um, community-based initiative is in Menominee County, um, which, is a, was a, which is a tribal, um, tribal area. So again, um, I think there's gonna be some new opportunities again for individuals living in these areas. Um, but separate from that, I believe on my next slide here, um, well, this just shows kind of in the last five years uh, when there were uh, almost, almost 50 REACH grantees, um, some of the areas we were able to work in, such as smoke-free environments, opportunities for physical activity, and then um, more self-management programs. Uh, this is an example from one of the tribal grantees in REACH. Um, so in Idaho, again, um, and folks may have heard about this, the Pow Wow Sweat Program. Um, this video had over 10,000 followers and likes and 100,000 views on YouTube. And again, it was just a really low cost way um, to include information. Um, I know that the Intertribal Council of Michigan had an initiative, a fiscal activity initiative as well, called What Moves You. Um, and after when we post these slides, we'll include a few other um, examples of tribal grantees through the REACH program uh, that were able to work in nutrition and physical activity solutions. 
Um, a current grant program that the CDC helps support is called Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country. And again, it's a partnership between CDC, uh, American Indian Alaska Native populations to again, strengthen cultural practices and healthy behaviors. Um, this has a pretty broad menu of interventions to choose from, which do include making traditional healthy foods more available, um, forms of physical activity, and avoiding commercial tobacco. Um, so that was funded in 2015 at approximately $16 million. Um, the picture here shows, again, um, small children learning the importance of healthy eating um, here through experiential through gardens. And the Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country, um, this map just shows, again, um, directly funded tribes, tribal organizations, um, tribal epicenters, and then sub-awardees. Um, so again, um, just one, um, one other way to really consider how to use public health practice cooperative agreements to consider making improvements in nutrition and physical activity, uh, stress, sleep, and other healthy areas. Um, related to culturally appropriate foods, um, here at CDC, um, each year we've been um, trying to ensure that our nutrition scientists um, um, are considering uh, improving their knowledge around um, indigenous and traditional foods. So um, if you haven't already, and, and this is coming up soon, but the Seeds of Faith, Seeds of Native Health Conference, uh, is occurring here in October in um, Minnesota again. This is an annual conference that brings together a large amount of stakeholders to really think about nutrition as it relates to native populations. Um, this year also they have extra workshops here on uh, ancestral beverages, youth gardens, healthy traditional foods, native edible plants, um, and more uh, interconnectedness of wellness and culture. So um, I know this is coming up soon, but um, hopefully it'll, it'll be an annual conference um, and just wanted to bring that to attention. Um, one of the things that we're interested in getting engagement on and input is the ability to think about our nutrition standards um, and how to ensure that we're um, uh, learning and understanding and including culturally appropriate food as part of those nutrition standards, whether that's in child care, school or food service guidelines. Um, just wanted to point out that on our data trends and maps page, there is probably additional information related to Native American populations. Um, so I would um, suggest that folks who are interested could take a look or you can benchmark um, with, your, with your state. And also this NCHS Fast Stats also has a page dedicated to Native um, American Indian health data. Um, just wanna point out a few resources on our website. Again, we have materials related to health equity thinking things about drinking water as an example. Um, we have resources that just point out how important it is to work in these areas. So if there's language here that's helpful, we'd be happy for you to utilize that. Um, the middle here is this unfit to serve that I mentioned very early on to talk about um, uh, in addition to health benefits, how we think about our young people and their ability to, um, to help serve the country. Also the importance of early care and education. Finally, if you're not already subscribed to some of our ongoing social media, um, here's our resources online, our website, the Facebook pages. Um, finally, an additional CEU I've placed at the bottom. Um, in August, we were able to have a CDC grand rounds that was specific to childhood obesity and really the importance of school um, in childcare, including a couple of our partners who are out there every day um, helping work with decision makers. So that's a one hour CEU for individuals who would like to take part in that. And thank you for your time. All righty, thank you, Captain Blank. And uh, at this time, we'll go ahead and uh, start taking some questions. If you have any questions, uh, we will take them up to the top of the hour just to uh, respect everybody's uh, time that's participating in the webinar. Um, so up until uh, four o'clock Eastern, we'll uh, for, for about the next 11 minutes, we'll take some questions. Um, so uh, the first person here asked, uh, will copies of the slides be available? Uh, we are gonna go ahead and um, upload a recording of the presentation along with the slide deck as a uh, PDF format up on our website. And our website is keepitsacred.org. K-E-E-P-I-T-S-A-C-R-A-D-R-E-D 
org, keepitsacred.org. Um, go on to the left uh, menu bar there and then click on blog and then you'll see the uh, webinar. You can also uh, look under resources and see webinar archives and you'll be able to see uh, today's webinar um, there. Uh, we're going to try to have that up um, by the end of the day today. So, um, Next person says, uh, North Dakota State University also received a HOP grant and will be working with the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa and Standing Rock Sioux Tribes. So um, I don't know if you had any comments to add on to that, uh, Captain uh Boink. Uh, just congratulations. That's wonderful. Um, so hopefully if there's anything, I know that you'll have a project officer assigned from our division, but if there's any any additional information that I can, um, my team or my group can support you with, um, just definitely let us know. We're excited for you. Excellent. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the question box and we'll uh, try to get those answered here before the top of the hour. Um, if you want to follow us on social media, you can follow the National Native Network on Facebook, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And then our website, of course, is keepitsacred.org. We are going to be having another webinar coming up uh, next Wednesday, one week from today. Um, today's webinar covered obesity, and we're going to stay within the same topic um, on obesity strategies for reach. So the uh, learning objectives are listed right there. And then visit our website, keepitsacred.org, and you can go ahead and register for the webinar um, right now, as a matter of fact. And uh, if anybody has any individual questions for uh, Captain Blank, feel free to uh, send her an email, and I'm sure she'll be happy to uh, get back to you. Um, we haven't seen any questions pop in just yet. Um, did you have anything that you wanted to add on, Captain Blake, maybe before we uh, sign off? Um, just to just to thank everyone, I think um, that as we've learned about obesity, you know, what we're learning is it's not as easy as calories in, calories out. It's not as easy as act, asking people to like eat less and move more. Um, you know, we're understanding that um, uh, one of the things about the body is that as a person gains weight and gains adiposity, that we do um, get what we call a new um, a new set point. And that when individuals try to lose weight, um, the body wants to preserve their weight. And so it actually changes the hunger cues. And so satiety receptors are actually down-regulated. So I think um, you know, we're approaching this area with, with more gentleness, uh, with understanding that there's not one solution um, that's going to fit all, that we do really need to think about um, you know, how we live our daily lives. And so stress management is such an important area. We know that many, many individuals at the end of the day um, you know, we'll turn to things like alcohol um, in, in other ways as coping skills for stress. Um, and so, again, you know, thinking about ways that we can um, not approach this only as nutrition and physical activity, um, but thinking about environments that support the household more broadly. Um, walking, uh, you know, as, as a family, it's one of these areas. Uh, walking pets um, is another area we've been actually uh, engage with some of the uh, veterinarian associations, um, which seems like a, um, a dis disparate group to talk with. But um, what they're finding is that because of um, pets having health problems too, uh, it disarms individuals to talk about the pet's health, much like when we talk about children's health. So I think we want to, you know, we're finding new solutions to be able to have the conversation about obesity. Um, we're thinking broader than just, um, you know, food and physical activity. We're really trying to think about how to support each other, you know, as, as humans um, in, the, in the tough days that we may have. So again, um, you know, we know food has so many um, parts to it um, related to our, our families and our cultures. And so I think, um, you know, really supporting each other, um, which I know that the, the uh, the tribal programs have done so well, which is really thinking about engagement um, and how to really ensure that if we're thinking about something like a standard that we're going to be able to have at organizations, which can lead to sustainable, healthy offerings, 
um, you know, how we do that the right way up front. So I just want to, you know, congratulate and thanks fo thank folks um, who really, you know, are thinking about nutrition, physical activity, sleep, um, you know, some of these ha habits, you know, not just for obesity, but again, for greater wellness, for stress management, um, because that's going to, that's going to benefit, um, you know, much, much larger than just, just the immediate health benefit that, that we often see in, in, in research papers. So again, um, thank you for, for being a champion and for learning with us today. Um, there was one question that did happen to pop in. It says, uh, was the difference in data and the decrease in rates due to the oversampling that was done during the last census? So um, I know from the WIC-PC data, for as an example, um, nationally, we were able to um, look at some other factors um, that such as household income and some of those areas because folks were worried that there might be even a recession effect around that 2010 data. Um, I will say when we were able to analyze it with that type of lens, we don't see a sampling difference. Um, so I think what we're seeing, at least if the data continues to go in that direction, we actually think it, it we hope it's real. Um, and there are some new studies coming out to try to think about, you know, what maybe led that to that decrease. So we do know when we look at 2010 to 2014, you know, we've seen improvements in breastfeeding. We've seen decreases in sugar sweetened beverages. Uh, we saw the improvement in the WIC food package, which now supports more breastfeeding, more whole grains, more fruits and vegetables. Um, and so I think, and, and then also as a nation, we're seeing more schools, more childcare, starting to make a difference. Um, so I think, you know, we're optimistic um, that, you know, what we're seeing in the, in the large data um, is real and not, you know, an artifact um, from, from the sampling. All righty. And we do want to remind everybody that there will be an email going out tomorrow. Um, it'll be about 24 hours, 24 hours from right now that will have a link to get your continuing education units. Just fill out the survey, let us know how we did, fill in your contact information, and then we will get a, a CE mailed out probably within about a month. So um, make sure you keep your eyes open for that. And um, with that, I think that we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up a couple of minutes early. Um, we wanna thank uh, Captain Blank for presenting for us today. And we will go ahead and sign off. Thank you very much to everybody who attended. Have yourselves a wonderful day.